So by the end of this week, you should have your blog all set up. You should have emailed me the URL. You can check the list online there, the list of blogs that I already have, to check that yours is there. And you should have your first post done by the end of this week as well. Okay. Um, I've published the spec online for the assessment for this module. So there's, there's three parts to that. There's going to be your blog, there's going to be an assignment on image compression, and there's going to be an essay. And in one of the classes earlier this week, um, I talked about the assignment spec, and I put that online. Because one class, one group was behind, I didn't discuss that with them at all. So they're going to just have to rely on the, the recording of that. What I propose to do with you guys today is rather than repeat what I said to that other class during the week, um, I'll maybe look at the essay titles and talk a bit about those. And so then um, it's maybe a more efficient use of, of the time we have so that you can go watch the YouTube video to find out about the different assessments and the other people can go and watch the YouTube video to discuss the essay topics. Okay, so this does involve you going and doing some looking at the spec yourself. So if you go to my blog, colinmcit.blogspot.com, you will see over here there's information about the assessment, and you can see there the specification is here, the list of blogs is here. There's a course I want you to take. You can start that now if you want. You can have it done then in time. Okay, but the, the specification itself is here. That might change ever so slightly. For example, there's no dates in that yet. So like for your essay, you'll have to hand up a draft and the final one, I haven't specified the dates yet, things like that. So there'll, there'll be only minor changes. Also, um, in terms of what you're gonna do for your blog, week to week, um, I might deviate from that slightly and say, this week I want you to do a movie review or something. So um, I had considered sort of specifying well in advance, week by week, what you do, but it might not be as, as rigid as that. We'll see. Okay. Um, what I have here is some titles for the essays. So what I thought I might do is just go through some of those just to give you an idea of what they're about. So you're going to need to research these and pick one that you'd like to develop and write your paper on. Okay? And I think we've specified that only three students can choose each topic. But doing the math, I think there's plenty of them there anyway. You can also suggest a topic if you like, and that'd be good too. Um, some of these topics I think are better than others. Some of them are harder to do than others. Some of them um, are easier to develop. Some of them it's, it would be hard to do something particularly interesting with them. No. So journalism in the internet age, that's an interesting one. Um, sites like Craigslist have cannibalized classified ads which was a mainstay of income for newspapers. So newspapers are under pressure financially. Doing hard investigative work is expensive. What kind of business models could be used in the newspaper business in the internet age? Similarly, um, what's a journalist nowadays? I mean, if you're downtown taking pictures of the floods and putting them on Twitter. You know, are you a journalist? Things like citizen journalism could be long in there. That's a, an interesting topic. You have to do a bit of research on that, but it'd be quite an interesting one. Location-based services and applications, that's more and more technical, but you could put a variety of different spins on that. But my smartphone knows exactly where I am right now. Perhaps there are things, you know, you could do with that. There are games you can play. There are, you know, sites where you can check in. Um, what happens if you check in on Facebook and it says you're in a particular place and then all your friends turn up? 
but actually, you know, you were on a date. I mean, all sorts of complicated issues. But there are, there are technologies and social things you can do by knowing where people are. Also, when you take a photograph, it's tagged with the location. Um, so it's possible to see exactly where and when the picture was taken. You know, what's, what's the story with all that? Localization is the process of adapting software and websites and content to local language and the often forgotten cultural norms of a different society. So if you um, make a piece of software and you want it to, to be a hit in Poland, you have to obviously translate it into Polish. But there may be other things you need to do also. The process of that, that's an interesting issue. But it's, it's a technical essay. Net neutrality is something that's um, topical right now. Um, up until very recently, all internet traffic traveled through the pipes of the internet unhindered at the same rate. However, it's open to an internet service provider to say to someone like Netflix, come here, you know, I paid for all this infrastructure and you're making loads and loads of money. How about if you give me, you know, a million dollars a year, I'll make sure that all UPC customers, you know, get very good access to Netflix. Um, some people might say that's extortion. Um, some people might say it's a form of, of censorship. I mean, what happens, like up until now, your crappy little website and some really big website pretty much got the same access to an audience. If someone wanted to go to, you know, danscoolpage.com or to cnn.com, well, pretty much, you know, the stuff arrived at the same time. But if we had a situation where, well, you know, danscoolpage.com took two minutes to download because you didn't pay the, you know, um, quality delivery service fee from the internet service providers, um, well, that could have implications even for a democracy. Um, another kind of issue is that until very recently, because I had an issue with it myself, if you had a data plan with mobile phone companies, you might get, say, a gig a month for your whatever, how many euro. But what some of them were doing is they wouldn't let you use Skype. Now, you might say, well, I mean, I'm paying for a gig. How I use my gig of data is my business like whether it's email, whether it's web pages, or whether it's YouTube, or whether it's Skype. But they were blocking Skype because, you know, it might stop you actually making international phone calls from your mobile and making them loads of money. So there's that kind of net neutrality as well from the consumer point of view. Um, even to this day, some mobile phone companies will um, sell you, you know, a gig a month. But if you want to connect your iPad to your iPhone using Bluetooth, and use your data that way, oh, well, then you have to pay extra. But you're like, well, extra for what? You know, I'm using my gig. How I use it, you know, how I bounce it around the house is my own business. And they say, ah, but no, 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 no. So that's, again, net neutrality from a, a customer point of view. And some networks are doing that right now. Okay, so, um, so it's a big debate in the US now, and people are trying to ensure that in Europe, at least, you know, net neutrality is guaranteed from a consumer point of view, but also, just from a kind of democracy and equality point of view. Um, policing the cloud is an interesting one. A lot now of our data is stored in the cloud. And there was a time if you were up to no good, the police could come to your house with a search warrant and take away all the papers and all the crap they found in your house. But I mean, what if you stuff in Hotmail or in Dropbox and it's not actually in the house, you know, can they go get it? How do they get it? Where is it stored? Where is your Gmail stored anyway? You know, do they have to go to some court in Louisiana to you know, get access to it? That's all very complicated. Crowdsourcing is an interesting topic. 
that's where you get people on the internet to contribute maybe their opinions or maybe some of their work and you end up with a situation where you can using a little bit of effort from lots of people achieve great things prediction markets is a subset of that and um, prediction markets are online gambling exchanges where people can bet on the outcomes of future events no paddy power is a prediction market like paddy power can you know take your money and depending on the outcome of you know real madrid versus uh, letico will give you you know a certain amount of money back but typically what prediction markets do um you might use them to predict how many printers you're going to ship you know next month that's not something paddy power would be interested in but you as a company might be very interested in so you might give your employees play money to make bets and you might get answers that way so that's interesting um, Blagola is an interesting enough topic. Um, there was a time, you know, 20, 30 years ago, where there would have been scandals whereby DJs would be paid money by record companies to play particular songs on the radio so they would become hits. And that term was payola. And that was, you know, a big scandal. Blagola gets its, its name from that and they say there that you're a blogger you know let's say I'm blogging about cool phones let's say I write a lot about um, the latest and greatest phones so suppose then Samsung comes out with a new phone and says hey Colin would you like to um, evaluate our phone and anyway, I mean and they might give me the phone to try out I mean obviously I can't you know it's a bit much just for me to go out and buy it um, so fair enough they could like loan it to me and there'd be nothing wrong with that but I mean you know setting up a new phone is a lot of hassle I probably wouldn't set up all of my you know accounts and my email and all of my stuff on a phone if I was going to have it for a week now if they said to me well you could keep the phone when you're done with it then I might be able to you know genuinely test all of its features because I would you know be a bit more invested in it at what point then have we crossed the line between when they're like, well, they're just bribing me? I mean, if they're giving me a free phone and then I write a crap review of it, I mean, well, they might not give me a free phone the next time. They've kind of incentivized me saying nice things about their phone. Have we crossed the line then between, you know, my giving an opinion and them bribing me with, you know, free stuff? Um, where do you draw the line? You know, do I need to declare on my blog, you know, I received a free phone from Samsung and you should, you know, consider that when you read my review of it. You know, what, what do you do? Podcasting, we spoke about um, in our first class. I won't go into that anymore. Um, although a bunch of DNets have got together and um, launched a podcast. Um, it's interesting. I'm not sure it's good, but, you know. You can find that if you want. Um, managing online reputation is something I've mentioned in the past and will probably mention again. But the stuff you put out there is, is, is there for a long time, perhaps forever. How do you manage how the world sees you? You know, if someone Googles you, what are they going to find out? How do you deal with problems if someone says something about you that's just not true? Or... If, if there's something on a web page or you know Google that's wrong or is harm, harming your reputation how do you address that how do you deal with that things like that and um, cyber squatting is something we might discuss in class that's the issue of people registering domain names in bad faith so you had for example people registering Bertie O'Hearn and Mary Harney um, and putting a load of porn on them and it's not that people looking for porn would you know search via Bertie O'Hearn but the objective really was just to embarrass them so much that they would cop off, cop off, um, cough up cash to make it go away and so how do you deal with that um, in the end the state um, followed there, there are you know established procedures for dealing with that and then they, they got those domain names back and um, 
Is TV dead? That's an interesting one. I think that's a hard one to do well, actually, in terms of in the past when people wrote on that topic, they tended to be a bit lazy. It was kind of almost too easy and, and the, the, the results were not very impressive, I found in the past. Um, Hollywood versus Silicon Valley. With all of these titles, they're a bit general. Some of them, you know, you might um, modify quite a bit and be more specific within, within that theme. So the idea here is that Hollywood is in Southern California and that's where they make, um, you know, that's where the recording industry and the movie industry and the television industries are based. Um, Silicon Valley is up the road a bit in Northern California, close to San Francisco, and they're very interested in new technologies, new distribution mechanisms for content, and, you know, they're slightly at, at war with each other. Um, you know, so, you know, TV companies are in Southern California and YouTube is in Northern California. Um, so just the whole issue there of, you know, digital rights management and all that stuff. You might tackle, you know, internet ethics or some, some subset of that, you know. Um, learning in the internet age. You know, what, what does college look like in 2014? To me, it looks a lot like 1914 and even 1814. It seems to me not to have changed very much at all. Um, in fact, I think if you transported, if you had a time machine and you transported someone from 100 years ago or 200 years ago, I think the place they would most recognize is, um, is a university. And it doesn't just change an awful lot at all. So what, what should it look like? What, what are we missing? Um, MOOCs, you may have heard of. Um, government 2.0. You know, what, what does government look like in the internet age? What does governance look like in the internet age? How, how can we use internet technologies to improve the way governments do their business? Um, privacy versus piracy. You know, two, two conflicting views there. Um, again, that's one that could be done quite lazily, so you'd have to think about that. Um, so law in virtual worlds, um, you could do something interesting with that. You could look at different approaches to laws in virtual worlds. So if you take World of Warcraft, for example, I mean, are there things that would get you banned from World of Warcraft? Do they have parallels in the real world? Um, or if you commit a wrong in World of Warcraft, or if you steal something in World of Warcraft, do crimes in virtual worlds, can they have consequences in, in real life? Um, also, do you need some authority? I mean, in the real world, we're used to giving the state and police authority to you know stop criminals and to punish crimes what happens in virtual worlds do you need some authority do you need a sysadmin that's going to you know be say to people stop being bold or can a community construct you know cultural and legal norms out of thin air and um, you might consider you know eve online or something and how how that works you might be able to do something interesting with, with that theme. Um, software patents is a more technical issue. Um, that's something we might discuss in class, but there are people who think that software shouldn't be patentable at all, and that, um, that it's you know, ruining soft the software industry and stuff like that. Um, have I duplicated education in the internet age? Learning in the internet, yeah, so I've duplicated that there. Okay, I'll fix that. So you could have some sort of like a guide to the social media landscape. So, you know, what's 
Facebook, Google+, Friendster, Twitter, Snapchat, Flickr, Instagram, you know, big shopping list there. What are all those things? Um, what are the main features of all of those? Um, you know, how are they funded? And what do they do? How do people use them? You could maybe have a sort of a, a guidebook or something. You may even, you know, discuss how they all fit together. Something like that. Okay. Metadata privacy, so that's more specific. You know, what's the big deal with that? You could look up, look into that. Universal design is to do with things like um, you might have a web page and then you might have a separate version of that web page for mobile phones but it's more to do with people with disabilities you might have another version of that then you know for people who don't see so well or whatever and universal design is about designing your software and designing your websites with accessibility in mind from the get-go and, and the theory there is you know well what's what's good for people with disabilities is is good for everyone you know if your site is difficult to navigate it's difficult you know for everyone that's not a good thing it's a bad thing as you should consider that search engine optimization is all about how to get your website ranked higher in Google as a lecturer looking at people's essays I know full well that many people sometimes just type something into Google and they never click past the first page it probably even hasn't occurred to them that you can scroll down and go to the next page so if you're selling something you know if you're selling iPhone covers it's really a big deal for you to be on you know as high up in the Google rankings as you can and you can't pay Google to put you higher up so how, how do you how do you earn that how do you get to be ranked higher um, this one is a bit a little bit frivolous but I was wondering it might be interesting to look at viral videos or viral ideas and to see you know is there a recipe for a viral video how do you make something go viral what, what are the features of viral videos how, how does that work that's something that could be interesting to investigate and to, to look at um, you'll notice too that some of these you could just sort of you know go to Google Google it you know you've got your five you know sites talking about it and you could maybe cobble something together others require a bit of thought and a bit of originality and a bit of investigation and in actual fact they are all expecting a bit of thought and a bit of originality and a bit of investigation and so if you pick something that seems too easy it, it might be too easy you know it might be hard for you to to contribute I mean like the is TV dead one you know that that can end up being very very dull and you know you, you need to think about that okay gold farming um, gold farming is a bit something like the um, it's related really to MOOCs and law and virtual worlds not MOOCs um, MOOCs and MOOCs are different um, like who knows what gold farming is so in say World of Warcraft you can have I don't know gold coins or something and you can buy a sword and it might cost you 20 gold coins no um, someone like me if I was playing World of Warcraft I probably wouldn't have time to go around and earn 20 gold coins by killing goblins or whatever do you know but suppose you were playing all day and you need some beer money you might sell me 20 virtual gold coins for like you know two pints worth and we might all consider that to be a good trade you know you get your beer I get my sword you have time I don't we're all happy but what does that then do to you know the in-game economy I mean is that cheating am I cheating you know, if I didn't earn my shiny sword of whatever you know I mean you know am I cheating um, but it's gone to the stage now where there are people in third world countries whose job it is to go around 
earning gold in order for it to be sold for real money and so that's that's gold farming so at what point is that cheating is what at what point is that exploitation I mean some people think their working conditions are terrible you know but maybe you know playing World of Warcraft all day is better than being down a mine you know there are complex issues um, and also it has impacts on, on, on the game itself I mean if you have to spend months getting to a certain level and some rich bastard in a suit can just pay to get at that level well how does that make you feel then about all your 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 effort you know if someone can just buy cool instead of earning it um, you can see these kind of got more interesting as I got down the list because you know once I got through the obvious ones I was thinking of more interesting things I think there's a very interesting essay to be written on fandom in the internet era do you know like 20 30 years ago you wrote a book or you made a TV show or you directed a movie and you were the author and you put it out there and people consumed it you know and they liked it or they didn't they didn't they could feck off the loop has sort of closed somewhat in that you know now when a, a show is airing you know you have people on Twitter saying what they like and, and, and don't like and that might actually have an impact on the the author you know maybe all the episodes aren't made yet you know I mean you know Jesse Pinkman was was you know was supposed to die you know did the fact that people liked him as a character make him survive make him become the hero or was that always the plan you know we'll, we'll never know do you know um, if you buy a book an ebook on Amazon and you read it on your Kindle and you only get past you only get to the second chapter and then you never read it anymore it's set up in such a way that the author of the book can know that now if um, if you're an author of a book and you have you know you know 10 different chapters and one chapter and um, you try something new it's a bit wacky and you find that you know 50% of your readers don't get through that chapter well you might not do that again because it could hurt sales if you find that lots of your readers skip straight to that chapter because they've heard like that's the best part and they're buying the book just for that chapter but then you might decide you know that wacky is the new me you know because I can make more money that way so now you have a situation where the fans of an author's work are interacting through the technology with the author and perhaps altering um, how things are, are done um, the best I think analysis of the interaction between authors and um, fans and works is in Supernatural where they set it up so that um, the real characters through some quirk of blah 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 have actual fans who end up interacting with them in the plot and it's, it's quite interesting how they've addressed this whole issue of the interaction of um, fans with um, authors and with content and of course you have the whole slash genre um, as well and then I thought there's a very general theme here which you would need to refine and, and discuss and figure out what you're going to do with but the whole idea of, of kind of remix culture there was a time when creativity was restricted to starting with a blank piece of paper or a blank canvas or a silence and then filling it with stuff that was entirely yours but lots of artists now react to the the media landscape that we're in you know where we're surrounded by content 
and, and their response to that is to remix that and to make new works from old. So I mean, in the 1960s, we started to see collage where you had people cutting out photographs and things from magazines and reassembling them and making new things. And the technology we have and the internet has accelerated that process. So that's something that could be um, interesting as well. So I think certainly um, they kind of go from, yeah, whatever, to, mm, yeah, kind of interesting, to starting to get it out there a bit. And, um, you know, so a fine selection there of things to choose from that you could tackle. And you've plenty of time now to think about that. No, think about that is not the same as um, deciding to think about it later. You know, thinking about it isn't putting it off. But you could, you know, look into two or three of these topics, think what you might do with them, pick one, and then research it, read around it, start writing about it, and beat it into shape, and you could have the bones of a very interesting piece of work. It's really easy to tell the difference between something that has been thought about and crafted and developed over two months and something that was kind of Googled, you know, in a panic 48 hours before the deadline and, and cobbled together. Um, about two minutes left, I'll just give you, I'll give you a brief summary of the no copying speech. Like, if you're copying and pasting, that's, that's cheating. It's as simple as that. Some people tie themselves up in knots by asking some, themselves the question, well, if I copy and paste from the web, how much do I have to change it then so that it's mine? And there is no answer to that question because copying and pasting from the web, if that's your starting point, that's where you've gone wrong there. It's a bit like asking yourself, if I rob a bank, how much do I have to give to charity to make that okay? It doesn't work like that. Like they still throw you in jail for robbing the bank. Okay, so um, you know, I, I spoke at length about that in the other class, so you can go and listen and, and, and watch that that video. So in the other class, where you can you can watch that on, online, I spoke about the other components of the assessment. I spoke a bit about the blog. I spoke a lot about the importance of getting the spelling and the grammar right. And I spoke a lot about the whole cogging issue. So between this class and that class now, you should have enough to go on to making a start on the assignments. OK, thanks, guys. Any questions? OK, see you soon.